History is always talked about as a subject that actually teaches you to avoid repeating some of the mistakes that might have been made. But also, what lessons have we learned from the past? So that, you know, as we move ahead, as the nation grows, how can we nurture it to become a nation? This is a country that has experienced relatively, when you take into account what has been happening around us, relatively peaceful transformation from one political party to another. This is a country, now we are having a fifth president and we've had this relative peace. How do you account for that? There are a number of challenges that we are facing in the economic field, in the political arena, there are challenges. How do we explain that? How do we, can we have a better Zambia? So that indeed as we move into the next uh, generation, what is it that we can do? So I want to believe that uh, this discussion that we are going to have this evening is going to illuminate some of these issues that uh, I'm highlighting. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and all distinguished guests here present, let me now uh, introduce the speakers for today. We have before us which person who is going to speak to, uh, to lead the discussion, uh, Professor Miles Lama uh, from Oxford University. Professor Miles Lama is not new in as far as Zambian history is concerned. He has done almost all his research and almost all his publications on Zambia. So he's quite familiar in terms of researching in Zambia. So while he's here this time, he's still continuing to conduct research to publish more. And uh, I first came uh, to know him when he was a PhD student, when he first came to Zambia to conduct research for his doctorate, which he successfully completed and started working at the University of Sheffield. From there, he moved on to the University of Oxford, where he is currently. After Professor Miles Lama has done his presentation, we have a discussion that is going to uh, look at uh, the discussion. And that uh, discussant is no other than uh, Dr. Kalusa. Dr. Kalusa is with the University of Zambia. He's a lecturer teaching history in the same department where I belong. I just want to say I first came to know Dr. Kalusa when he was a student of mine, when he was doing his uh, undergraduate studies. That's when I first uh, knew him. He went on to graduate uh, with his first degree, proceeded to do a master's degree, and went to John Hopkins University in the United States, where he obtained uh, his PhD. Uh, by that time, he was already a member of the Department of History. So these two colleagues that are here are people that are personally known for quite a number of years. We've interacted academically and have every confidence that they are going to keep us well informed about the past 50 years of Zambia's history. Let me now invite Professor Maus Lama to give us his presentation. Thank you. Um, Professor Perry, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Your Excellencies, Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask in a way the question, what is a nation and what is the Zambian nation? And as Mr. Musukanya and Professor Piri have suggested, the country's approaching 50th anniversary provides a central occasion not only to celebrate Zambia's achievements, but also to consider the meaning and significance of nationhood. Historians of Zambia, both here and international, internationally, have been considering these questions in the run-up to independence over the last couple of years. We had a major conference here in 2012 on the theme narratives of nationhood. And we have just recently published uh, a special issue of the Journal of Southern African Studies, 
co-edited by Professor Piri and myself, which includes a number of papers delivered at that conference, which try and ask questions about the meaning of Zambia 50 years on. And I'm going to, in this presentation, briefly touch on some of the core ideas in those papers, which I modestly present to you. And I realized the other day, um, I realized uh, as someone who's been thinking about Zambian history now for 25 of the 50 years of Zambian independence, which is something of a shock to myself. Just to give you an idea, I think all historians, it's, it's uh, wrong to assume that historians come from some neutral, objective standpoint. We all have a personal experience. We're all formed by our own experience. And I myself first came to Zambia in 1991 in the midst of the campaign for multi-party democracy. And we have some of the leaders of that campaign here in the audience today. For me, this was an inspirational experience. On the streets, in meetings, in large rallies, in households, ordinary Zambians debated how to improve their lives, how to achieve a more participatory, representative form of government. And that's affected my own work ever since. Uh, I always have this hope and belief that Zambians have their ability to make their situation better. Sometimes, as historians, we have to explain why perhaps those hopes and expectations aren't always fulfilled. To say a few obvious things to begin with, Zambia does not have an ancient past as a nation states. Its separate peoples have their own very proud, distinct histories, but Zambia, like most nations in the world, only came together in its current form as a result of the actions of European imperialists. So anti-colonial rebels built new nations within the borders imposed by their enemies. And this creates a certain type of contradiction in a way. Zambians built a new society, an identity, out of a combination of their pre-colonial past and their experience of anti-colonial resistance. The symbols of Zambian nationhood, the flag, the anthem, the copper domed parliament building, these were forged, perhaps smelted, as they would say on the copper belt, in the nationalist struggle itself. Zambians are rightly proud of the known heroes of that struggle, but there are thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, of heroes of that struggle who remain unknown. We can think about those who were killed, beaten by colonial police, those who had their homes burned and their livelihoods destroyed in the Cha 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 uprising of 1961, for example. But I want you to imagine the wider experience of independence. Imagine a young man attending a rally in a copper belt town organized by one of the nationalist parties. How is this change that's being promised, this advent of self-rule, going to make it easier for him growing to provide for his family, to live a better life. Imagine an older woman in Samfia, for example, hearing the translation of those nationalist messages and making a connection between the wider idea of independence with a capital I, formal independence, to notions of freedom and independence with a small I. How will her children, her grandchildren, her family, her community live a better life in the future? All of that was part of the transition to independence. And those hopes and expectations matter because they shaped how ordinary Zambians came to experience and judge the period after independence. We tend to think of the struggle as one led by some ways dominated by the United National Independence Party, UNIP. We know a lot now about the important role equally played perhaps by the African National Congress, but the fact remains that it was UNIP that came to power, and it was UNIP that was in the pole position, not only to set the country's policies in terms of development, but also the way in which the country was imagined. I was recently in the UNIP archives, accessible here in Lusaka, looking at the way in which the celebrations to mark independence on the 24th of October 1964 were organized. And you can see how the very symbols of nationhood and party were intentionally merged together in those celebrations. So it's very difficult to think about Zambia 
in its early period of independence without thinking about UNIP, and perhaps we don't need to. But it's worth considering the idea that we have a nation formed in the image, in many ways, of a political party and a political leadership. UNIP governed Zambia for 27 of the last 50 years. And we can consider the question about whether Zambia has yet escaped that nationalist moment in its history. I won't be the first person who has pointed out that many of the country's political leaders throughout that period, even to today, are still drawn primarily from that generation born before independence. There are very few younger Zambians who have come for, to the fore in national politics, and perhaps that's a legacy of that period. The achievements of the first republic government are often praised by memoirs, by many studies of Zambian history. And there's a contrast drawn between that period and that of the one-party state. I want to argue, perhaps provocatively, that many of the seeds of the problems that occurred in the one-party state period were sown in the transition to independence. Zambians expected a rapid transformation in their lives as a result of self-rule. And that may have been unrealistic, but it reflected the promises made by nationalist politicians. For example, for full employment. If we turn again to those archives of UNIP, we can see there that from the start, from the day one of independence, the party leadership was besieged with demands from its supporters across the new nation for improved services, for the building of roads, for the digging of wells, for schools and clinics. Individual leaders were expected to deliver to their areas of origin. And we see leaders blaming their failure sometimes to deliver those resources on the unfair distribution of jobs and resources from Lusaka out to the provinces and districts. Something which fueled a competition for the, div div the division of resources on a regional and sometimes on an ethnic level. Nor was what we call corruption absent from this period. Certainly some ministers and senior officials were embroiled in scandals about agricultural funds. What we might see as stealing was widely understood as an essential element of political business, of rewarding one's supporters. Valentin Musakanya, first cabinet secretary, offers a critique of such practices. Ministers would turn up at his door demanding places for hometown boys on training courses or jobs, regardless of their abilities. But this, for me, reflects this competition, this earnest desire to deliver, tied to the need to demonstrate to the party's supporters in its slogan that it paid to belong to UNIP. In addition, the relatively liberal constitution that Zambia was given at independence, and ironically a constitution completely at odds with the authoritarian way Britain had ruled northern Rhodesia, was undermined by measures, a series of measures, the undermining and then abolition of effective elected local governments, and the, the replacement of, for example, quite powerful local mayors in urban areas with district governors or district commissioners, effectively replicating a colonial district officer model, highly centralized, controlled from the center, top down. The declining recognition of the important role played by chiefs and chiefly authorities in rural areas. Such changes reflected a sense that a liberal constitution would not enable the rapid change Zambia needed economically and socially. But the main effect, I think, of those changes was to distance the state from the people that had just elected the government. A negative legacy that remains in place, I think, is a very powerful presidency, a relatively weak parliament, and virtually non-existent independent local government. One of the reasons why Zambians looked to the state for economic uplift was the limited opportunities available to them in the private economy. Zambia was an independence, one of Africa's wealthiest countries, very high GDP comparatively, but it was also an economy dependent on mining and had very low levels of education and training. Indigenous northern Rhodesians, Zambians, had very little experience of running businesses, and there were huge barriers to setting up businesses. 
a lack of access to credit, but also, amongst many politicians, a fairly hostile attitude to independent entrepreneurialism. State interventions in the economy, for example, the takeover of shops, retail, in the late 1960s, arguably made things worse. There's a lot of history here which is yet to be written. I'm interested in these sort of decisions taken to locate uh, a battery factory in Mansa or the Fiat plant in Livingston, for example. We know very little about these rather interesting examples. Fundamentally, and despite sincere efforts to diversify the economy, Zambia remained dependent largely on mining, but failed to create linkages to ensure that mining would benefit the wider population. Mine nationalization, it's generally agreed, was carried out for political rather than economic reasons. And nationalization did not improve the contribution of the industry to job creation or to society as a whole. And this became stark very clear in the mid-1970s when the international copper price collapsed and the country moved from a domination economically by mining interests to a domination by donors, the IMF, the World Bank and Western donors. The debt burden leading to the implementation of economic liberalization policies, again, not designed by Zambians and not really in the control of Zambians. That led also to economic liberalization and privatization. And I spent much of last week in the ZCCM archives in Ndola, which has an enormous wealth of literature on the privatization process. It's been the subject, of course, of claims and counterclaims and a few court cases in recent years, but there's a lot still to be learnt about that process. Today, the economy has apparently revived. We have high levels of growth, but continuing questions about the distribution of wealth. And here we can see asking historical questions might enable Zambia to learn about what is happening today. How can the country ensure it benefits more from mineral extraction than it did in the past? How do today's investors compare to those of the 60s and 70s? What happened to those previous efforts at economic diversification? And can a nation like Zambia really achieve economic independence in today's globalized world. Now, of course, a second equally important challenge for Zambia was the threat posed by hostile settler regimes and the Portuguese colonies. Zambia's international reputation in many ways rested during this period on a recognition of the sacrifices made that it, that it made to ensure its neighbors achieved self-determination. I think what's sometimes missed in analyses of that process is the relationship between regional liberation and national politics. President Kawanda often sought to delegitimize his opponents by accusing them of links to Rhodesia and South Africa. And whilst that wasn't always untrue, it's also clear that such accusations were often unwarranted. The threat posed to Zambia by its regional enemies was used to justify constitutional changes, and particularly a state of emergency that once declared was in practice used to repress UNIP's internal comp competition. And the ruling party's many critics believed that Zambians were making undue sacrifices for their regional partners, most notably with the closing of the Rhodesian border in 1973. Those who organized the 1980 coup attempt believe they might succeed because, with Zimbabwean independence, the excuse for secrecy, authoritarian rule, had ended. And because the troops of Joshua and Como's Zapu party had left the country. Troops that, it was believed in some circles, were a more reliable pro kawanda force than parts of the Zambian army itself. I think during this period, President Kawanda and his advisors conducted what we might call a realist policy that rested on their reading of Zambia's national interest. But the question can be asked, I think, that whether the price, the price for the high principles for which President Kawanda was widely praised internationally were paid by a Zambian population that after 1972 had no way of choosing to make that sacrifice. We still have huge gaps in our knowledge of this period. We lack detailed histories of the Zambian army, its activities in relation to liberation movements, how those conflicts were conducted, particularly in border regions like in western Zambia, how they affected the local population 
and their attitude to the nation state. Zambians also remain largely in the dark about the real history of their intelligence services, which played an important role in managing dissent during the one-party state. Paradoxically, because Zambia, as Professor Piri suggested, has managed its political transitions with little overt violence compared to many African countries, there has been no public reckoning of the extent to which unlawful detention and occasionally torture were used. There has, for example, been no equivalent to South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I want to make it clear, South Africa experienced a far greater level of repression and violence during this period that led to that commission. We've heard recently that some former political prisoners have received awards of increased compensation for their unlawful detention, but not much more beyond this. In my own research, I interviewed former dissidents whose peaceful opposition to the one-party state led to detention and indeed experiences of torture. And some of those received compensation, particularly during the presidency of late Levi Monawasa. But they received compensation only on condition that they sign confidentiality agreements that they would not disclose details of those payments. And this seems to me an interestingly Zambian way of perhaps dealing with this challenge. A degree of mercy is shown for these people suffering, but there's a, at the same time a silencing of evidence that might disrupt the occasionally nostalgic view of history of the country's recent past. Now, it's clearly too early to make full comprehensive judgments about Zambia's record over the last 50 years. We don't have enough information, material is still coming to light, many of these events were very recent. And as Professor Piri has said, if we make a comparative analysis, the country has suffered far less violence and upheaval than virtually all its neighbours, to the north, to the east, to the west and the south. Perhaps its early experience of migration, urbanisation, inter-ethnic mixing, have contributed to an unwillingness, uh, a steadfastness against the sort of overt tribal politics or ethnic hostility that have been seen in many African countries. Although ethnic and regional divisions have certainly played a role in election, electioneering. But at the same time, poverty and inequality levels remain very high. Zambia was named a couple of weeks ago as one of the most undernourished countries in the world. So my provocative question to you is whether these two things are related in some way. Could it be that Zambian's famous tolerance, peacefulness, uh, recognition of authority is in some ways combined with an unwillingness, an inability to effectively challenge political authority and sometimes elite wrongdoing that has sometimes left people ill-equipped to engage in the necessary political conflict that might address their aspirations and grievances. Is the peace and stability that Zambia is famous for always to be celebrated? The anthropologist James Ferguson interviewed copper belt miners in the late 1980s, and one of them wrote to him, we like peace like anyone else, but if that peace cannot buy you food, medicine, and clothes, then it's a mockery. Ultimately, our analysis of Zambia's successes and failures on these questions rests on an assessment of what we think was possible. We might, on the one hand, look back positively on a well-meaning but inexperienced leadership that did its best in difficult circumstances and was overcome, ultimately, by external factors. Or we might argue that Zambia's disastrous economic decline, its significant, although certainly not extreme, political repression, was the fault of its leaders, squandering the country's opportunities and mineral wealth and refusing to hand power to those who might do better. Whatever judgment we make about this, I think it needs to be based not on emotional appeals to patriotism, but on the systematic analysis of evidence. And here I want to return to what Mr. Musakanya was saying at the beginning, because perhaps one of the more obvious ways in which Zambians are struggling or maybe ill-equipped in some ways to analyse these questions is their limited access to their own historical experience. Zambians that I've met over the last 20, 25 years have consistently demonstrated a thirst for learning, debating about their own history on minibuses that I've been on, in meetings that I've been in, occasionally in bars that I've been in. 
people understand that Zambia is today the result of this history, but Zambians lack access in most cases to even those histories which have been published. Internationally, of course, in expensive books and obscure academic journals. Historical research in Zambia, despite the fact that Zambians have many fine historians, from Samuel Chipungo, Wilma Musachimbi, to the gentlemen here and to one or two in the audience that I can see, despite that, historical research, which is time consuming, sometimes expensive, is badly resourced in Zambia. And newer Zambian historians and younger students generally lack the opportunities and time funding necessary to visit archives and carry out interviews. University of Zambia was funded, as many of you will know, by ordinary Zambians who imagine their children and grandchildren learning, gaining a world-class education there. And it's that enthusiasm for learning and knowledge that needs to be practically channeled. Without this, Zambia's history can remain focused on simply a couple of key events, the annexation by colonists, the liberation and independence. I've been t talking to some of the school students about what they've learned about Zambian independence, and it seems to me that sometimes they lack access to the very building blocks of historical knowledge that will enable them to assess the past in relation to the present. Now, I just want to finish more optimistically. There are, there's much being done to address these sorts of challenges. The Network for Historical Research in Zambia, chaired by Professor Piri, has done much to bring academic, non-academic, Zambian and non-Zambian historians together pooling our knowledge, addressing areas for future research. UNSA Press has published many important historical works. And the Journal of Southern African Studies, we've run workshops trying to train young historians in writing. Our plan is to republish this special issue as a cheap local book sometime next year to make it widely available. Great strides have been made in protecting threatened archival material, the digitization of district notebooks in the National Archives, the collection of private papers of retired politicians, the cataloguing of the UNIP archives, and the publications by the Lembani Trust, all of which have been driven partly by the singular efforts of Dr. Maya Hinfala, who's been mentioned already, born in the Netherlands, but I think in many ways a patriotic Zambian at heart. I had the honor to edit the papers of late Valentine Musakanya, Zambia's first cabinet secretary, and that for me was an important example of producing a, a the, the reviewer in the Times of Zambia criticized the book for looking a bit cheap at the time it came out. And, and in a way, this was our purpose, not to produce some prestigious hardbound book that would sit on people's shelves, but something that would cost a few kwacha and be widely available. And I think this is what we need to do more of. More needs to be done to bring historical knowledge into the popular public domain. This event and the programs we're doing on Radio Phoenix at the moment are the sorts of initiatives we are trying to discuss. It's certainly the responsibility of international researchers like myself to find ways of ensuring that Zambians have access to their own historical knowledge, but we can't do this alone. And frankly, if it was left, if we had an initiative that wasn't driven by Zambians themselves, then I think ultimately it would fail. But I would, just to finish, be interested to hear from some of you this evening about what more can be done, what you think we should be doing to strengthen informed discussion and debate on Zambian history in ways which engages with the majority of Zambians, that links historical questions to their daily experience, their hopes and fears and aspirations, not just as they reflect in the last 50 years, but as they look forward to the next 50 years and beyond. Thank you very much. Let me invite uh, Dr. Kalusa to come and uh, give his response to the paper by Professor Myos Lama. Dr. Kalusa. Uh, I wish to begin by saying that uh, when I was invited to come here to participate in uh, the discussion this evening, I was most uh, reluctant to accept the invitation because I was uh, worried that uh, uh, Professor Lama would uh, bombard me with a long paper, a uh, very intricate paper, uh, and it would require a lot of time for me to do so, and I didn't have time uh, to do that. Fortunately, uh, he hasn't given me a long paper. What he has given me 
are notes that will constitute the foundation of our discussion this evening. And, and so he has made my work very easy and also is a very eloquent speaker. And uh, I'm sure you have understood the gist of his uh, presentation. Professor Lama raises a number of questions in his uh, presentation and in his paper. Um, questions that uh, we are familiar with. Uh, he raises the question of uh, what is the Zambian nation, for example? Um, what have been Zambian experiences since, since independence? Political experiences and economic experiences. He also raises the question of Zambia's involvement in the struggle uh, for independence in our neighboring, uh, in our among our neighbors, in Zimbabwe, Angola, and in other parts of Southern Africa. All these questions, as I've already said, are familiar. We are very familiar with them. However, he raises a number of interesting questions on uh, on these issues. Questions that have not been raised um, by Zambian historians and indeed other academics working on Zambia. What I don't know though is whether I agree with the, how he answers these questions. And I'll try to demonstrate to where I'm a bit concerned uh, regarding the manner in which he responds to his own questions. Historians ask their own questions and they answer them. The first question he raises, as I've already said, has to do with the question of what is the Zambian nation? He goes on to tell us that Zambia has, is not an ancient nation. It was created barely, you know, a few decades ago. Of course, you cannot compare Zambia to other long-standing nations in Europe, for example. His answer is that Zambia must be understood as a consequence of political action by, first of all, the colonizers who created the boundaries, for example, that now make up what we call Zambia. He also argues that we must understand Zambia as a, a consequence, the consequence of uh, the political actions of post-colonial leaders. He goes on to argue, for example, that it is the people in UNIP, leaders in UNIP, who forged the, the symbols of nationhood. They are the ones, for example, who crafted the Zambian national flag, the coat of arms, and therefore they bestowed uh, symbols uh, of nationhood on Zambia. Here, I am a bit worried. And my question to uh, Professor Lama is this. Can we really understand this nation as uh, something that was crafted or made by political players or political actors alone? Is it sufficient to see Zambia as something that uh, unique leaders and indeed the colonial masters uh, were involved in creating. If we look at uh, Zambia from this perspective, we lose out one important uh, aspect. What is the role of ordinary people in the creation of this nation? I'll be the last one to uh, accept an argument that uh, portrays Zambia as the creation of political players alone. We need to think of how ordinary people in rural areas in urban Zambia, how they have imagined the nation of Zambia. And I, I would like uh, uh, Professor Meyer to deal with this in a little bit more detail uh, when he takes the floor again. The other question which he raises is the question of history. He seems not to be satisfied with the manner in which Zambian history has been written. And here perhaps I'm bound, I'm bound to agree with him. Most of the early histories on Zambia were written by people who uncritically accepted the unique meta-narrative of Zambian history. 
It may not be appropriate for me to point out the exact names of these historians, but I, I hope you agree with me that the earliest writers and question and questioningly accepted the manner in which post-colonial leaders in this country imagined our history. It was the history of UNIP, for example, which mattered most to most of the early writers, such as, for example, uh, David Mufford and many other Western scholars who were interested in the Zambian history. Again, the question here is, what about the common man? How does he perceive the history of this country? I want to believe that the history of Zambia is not the history of a few political actors or entrepreneurs. It is the history of everyone. It's the history of the common man in the village. And we historians will do well to pay a little bit more attention to reconstructing this kind of history, factoring in the ordinary Zambian. We must move away from glorifying the fathers of independence as it were. We accept that they did their role in liberating the country from political hegemony or colonial hegemony, but we must also appreciate that they themselves uh, do not make up Zambia and the history of Zambia is not the sum total of their achievements. He goes on to talk about uh, problems that have dogged Zambia since 1964. A familiar theme, I guess. He highlights, for example, that uh, following the collapse of uh, um, uh, copper prices, um, the rise in the oil prices in the 70s, um, Zambia began to face uh, the economic doldrums from which the country has barely escaped. But he does more here. He argues that part of the country's political problems can also be understood in terms of economic mismanagement that, you know, characterized Zambia in the aftermath of independence. Perhaps no one would disagree with that kind of perception or argument. Professor Lama also talks about uh, Zambia's role in the liberation of Southern Africa. And here he asks a number of interesting questions. What price did we pay as a country when we gave aid to liberation movements from Angola, Mozambique, South Africa, and the other, uh, other regions in Southern, Africa, in Southern Africa? Are we still smarting from this kind of scenario in which we gave so much aid to our neighboring uh, countries, uh, what price did we pay? Perhaps the audience here might want to reflect on this. I know there has been a lot of literature that has been generated on this question with the two schools, of, schools, schools which are visible. There's on the one hand, one school of thought which blames Zambia's economic problems on the country's involvement in uh, the liberation of Southern Africa. The other school of thought is a bit skeptical and would rather blame the ill-conceived political and economic policies um, pursued by post-colonial leaders uh, as the root of uh, the economic problems of the country. In the last part of his paper, he asks how should we judge Zambia? How should we judge Zambia? And his answer is uh, murky, is not as clear as I would have loved to see. And it's for, good, for a good reason. Zambia has been independent only for 50 years, and perhaps it's too early for us to judge the country. It is perhaps too early to put a finger on what are the achievements of the country and what, what are its failures. However, we have challenged as historians, as academics, to explore this question, to see um, how we can understand the country's first, first 50 years of independence. There are also 
what he calls silenced and forgotten histories. Uh, here I want to give him credit. Zambian history is very unbalanced, so to speak. Zambian history has been the history of the winners of independence rather than the ordinary people, as I earlier said. Uh, Zambian history has been the history of the, the victors rather than the ruled. It's high time that we perhaps began to think more critically about this. Because like I've said, the history of this country is not the history of just those who participated in the struggle for independence. It's the history of everyone who claims to be Zambian. Uh, in particular, I want to add here that among the silenced histories uh, is the question of what role traditional rulers played in the struggle for independence. When you read most of the literature on the struggle for independence, you will see that uh, traditional rulers are either sidelined or are portrayed as just, uh, you know, uh, blind followers of the nationalist elite. And yet, the truth of the matter is that chiefs did play a very critical role in the struggle for independence. In my first book, which I published a few years ago, I focus on the uh, Kalonga Baundi, uh, the 10th uh, uh, Kalonga of the Chewa people. And I show, perhaps convincingly, if I may, I may post for a little while, I try to show that he, he was a key player in the struggle for independence. He did mobilize his people, and he spoke their language, he understood their problems, and he was able to articulate the, the, the cause of nationalism in a language that made logic and cultural sense to them. Something that the nationalist elite may not have been capable of doing, given that they were not able to speak, some of them were not able to speak Chichewa, and yet uh, Karonga Gawundi uh, spoke the language and he used it very effectively to articulate the nationalist cause. We may also want to see the role of uh, ordinary people, villagers, in the struggle for independence, and I like it much more than historians have done so far. Among the people died for this country were villagers, particularly during the Chachacha campaign, which uh, Professor Lama alludes to in his paper. We historians need to revisit this and uh, bring to light the importance of ordinary villagers in the struggle for this country. Thank you very much.